All right, so I entitled it, uh, Where or Where Can the Birds Go? Um, as, as Anne mentioned, um, I've been banding birds into Dean Hammock Park, and then also within the last two years, Caladesi Island State Park. And uh, the organization I founded two years ago is called Florida Avian Conservation. So, um, so basically what I'm gonna do is give you an overview, just a brief overview historically of bird banding, when it started, where it started, um, what's going on in the United States. And then uh, for those who've never been to a, a banding station, um, we will, um, I'll go over just the process, you know, um, why we do it, but also how we do it. And then, like I said, at the end, we'll do a, a, a quiz and then I'll take questions um, at the end. So let's proceed. All right. So the history of bird banding actually started over in France um, and it happened to be with royalty. Um, one of the the uh, I think King Louis the Fourth or something like that had uh, his favorite peregrine falcon. He had a uh, band around the bird's leg, and uh, it was actually a metal band, and that was in 1595. So uh, I believe his his peregrine falcon got lost, and it was recovered in Turkey, um, quite a distance away. Um, and then, of course, in the United States, most people affiliated with Audubon societies know about John James Audubon. And you may or may not know that he was, at least as far as they can tell, the first person in, in the United States who, who put um, a marker on, on a bird's leg to, uh, to track it in a sense. So he had the question, he had some Eastern Phoebes nesting over his uh, doorway in one of his buildings, and he put a little silver thread on the, the hatchlings and because he wanted to know, are they the same Phoebes that come back? And that's one question that, that a lot of people have um, with different different species. So, and sure enough, the next year, two of them came back. So, um, so from then it just has grown. Um, in the early 1900s, the Smithsonian was involved and made it more systematic and scientific. Then in the 20s, they expanded the banding program um, and created the North American Bird Banding Program. And most of the banding early on had to do with, um, it, it focused on waterfowl. So um, ducks and geese and things like that. And, and even to this day, uh, the majority of the birds that are banded in North America actually, or at least in the United States are waterfowl. Um, so it's, it's an important tool as I'll say in a minute or show you in a minute, um, the wildlife biologists use to, um, to estimate populations and trends in populations and Probably from that they they determine bag limits and everything. So, um, so some people you know you might know want to know well, why why ban birds? It seems like a lot of trouble. It might be stressful on the birds, that sort of thing. So some of the primary reasons we do it um, determining the migratory pathways of of these birds, um, both in our in western and eastern hemisphere, um, we've learned a lot. Uh, over the years from where these birds go based on recoveries of the bands. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, so once you put the band on the bird's leg, here's the, the, the aluminum band that we put on every bird. And then it's depending on the study like this one here, um, they'll use uh, color bands, unique color band combinations so that you can identify the bird without having to recapture the bird. So that's one reason they do it. Also to determine the survival rates um, of and causes of, of birds de declining in populations, um, and then estimating sizes of populations. So you can see some of the different species. You know, the birds, as we've heard recently in the last uh, few years, um, they actually have quantified how many billions of birds are uh, are disappearing and how quickly they're going. And most most of the species are on the decline. So um, so this is one tool that we have to to estimate the rate uh, at which they are declining. Um, and so this is a, a, an estimate, maybe a little higher now, the, that how many birds are banded every year, one, one, a little over 1 million birds. Most of those are waterfowl. Um, and then how, how they use the, the data, they use it to create the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which recently was under, under assault, but luckily it got reauthorized and, um, so that's a good thing, protecting all these migratory birds that we all love to, to see. 
So I'll give you a little bit on the um, when I started banding. I actually started in 2011. Um, I had learned to band birds up in Wisconsin. And when I moved down here, I uh, started working at Brooker Creek Preserve. I was not able to do it in the county preserves. But when I moved over to Learning Gate, I started examining places to do a project. And actually, Mary Marianne Carosi uh, suggested the ha Hammock Park. And I live like three miles from the park. So it was a park I was very familiar with and, uh, you know, had birded a lot and knew uh, that it was a, a pretty good place. Uh, lots of variety of birds moving through there. So we did a one day test bird banding just to see, okay, what, what kinds of things might we catch? And then in the spring of 2012, we started banding um, six, six times in six days in the spring and six days in the fall um, in Hammock Park. So we did it for you know, a good 10 years or nine to 10 years. Um, and this is what we're looking to do, figure out, you know, monitor the birds using bird surveys, but also by migrate, by banding the birds, you can document species that you don't necessarily see. Um, so that's one, one tool, one advantage to this. Um, things like Kentucky warblers, Swainson warblers, things like that, that most people don't even know are there. Um, also to give some information to the city of Dunedin, on have managing their habitat and um, helping with grants. I know some of the data that we've collected, we shared with them and it allowed them to expand or supported the expansion of the park uh, uh, to hundred acres. So, so those are some of the, the goals um, for the, the project. Um, as Ann mentioned, the, the location. So this right here is actually Ham Hammock Park right here. Um, even though the labels are uh, reversed. And then this is the school. So about the same time I started banding in the hammock, I've also started banding on the campus of my school. So Learning Gate Community School is an environmental charter school. We have 30 acres of oak wooded habitat. So um, actually I'll be banding there tomorrow <laughs> and on Monday. So, and then here's uh, Caladesi. So we'll talk first about uh, the, the project at Dunedin, and then we'll talk a little bit about Caladesi. Um, so a little bit about what, how, how we do go about banding birds. Um, we catch cool birds like this, the Kentucky warbler, which we caught two of them on Caladesi Island last Sunday. Um, so the first thing you have to do is you definitely have to get up early. The goal is to get the nets. Um, the nets are 12 meters long and about four meters high. Um, so about roughly 36, 35, 36 feet long. Um, and we set them up in the dark you want them open about 30 minutes before um, dawn. Um, that's when you're gonna get the most birds is, is early in the morning. Um, and we set up in Hammock Park, we've set up as many as 12. I think uh, on Saturday when we're doing our public banding demonstration, we might only set up 10 or 11. Um, some of you might recognize this guy. Um, this is Jason Gerard who was living in Land Lakes until a few years ago. So he, he definitely helped out. Then we set up the banding station once the nets are up. We've gotten fancy over the years. We have a, actually have our own pop-up tent, <laughs> but a lot of times banders just band out of the back of their truck on the tailgate of their truck, or in here we just have a couple folding tables, so it it it, you know, it doesn't require a whole lot. Um, and so once you're set up, then you then you go check the nets. So, um, but you got to have some tools. You look right here. I asked my students what these are, and they have no idea. Um, that these are old film canisters. So you see the size of the bands here. So um, diff different birds have different size legs and we have different size bands. This is my scale. So most of the birds we're catching are blue jay size or smaller. So that's what we're after. And that's why we've got all these warbler bucks so we can sex them and identify them and that sort of thing. Um, so then you check the nets every 30 minutes. Um, these are called mist nets. Even though this photograph makes them look very um, visible, when you step back from the net and your eyes focus across the net, they disappear. You, you just don't see them. And that's the way they work. The bird, you put them in flyways or areas where the birds are um, flying around. Um, and then we set up the nets. The birds come flying along and they, they uh, go into the net and there's enough give in the net and they just fall down into what's called the pocket. And then the birds are just waiting there um, for you to come um, extract them from the net. So once you do that, um, this is the part that takes years of practice. Um, this is one of my former volunteers, a Anastasia, who's now living in Germany. But uh, you have to, as quickly 
and efficiently and as quietly um, as possible, you get the birds out of the net. Um, we don't talk to the birds, they're not pets, they're wild animals. So um, we're just trying to be very efficient and get them out of the nets. Then we put them in these bags, which again, might look like it would be stressful, but it actually calms them down. And depending on when you're banding, when I was banding in, in, um, in Wisconsin, we actually used old tube socks because it actually kept the birds warm. As we were banding, it was 40, 45, 50 degrees. Uh, we don't have that problem here in Florida. But um, so the birds um, can't see what's going on around them. So it, it calms them down. And then uh, we process them in the order that we caught them. So um, you, you, before you can put a band on a bird, you need to know what kind of bird it is. All right. So you need to be identif able to positively identify the bird. So that's where all those field guides come in. So um, in this case, we have a uh, prothonotera warbler, um, one of our my former volunteers love taking pictures of the bird with a picture of the bird. Um, I call it our, it was our literacy program. We're teaching the birds to read, but anyway, so identify the bird first. Then next step is this is what's called a, a leg gauge. And for the most part, we, I don't use this a, a lot, but if, if there's a, you know, a size, a question about the size, you want to make sure the band is the right size, not too small, not too, too large for obvious reasons. So, um, so you, you slide the bird's leg into these slots and depending on the species, um, like cat birds take a 1A. So a one or a zero or zero A would be too small and these would be too big. So um, you gotta get it just right. Then um, you have, we have special banding pliers. I don't know if you can see these very well. I do have a pair here. I can show people at the end if you wanna see them maybe more closely. Um, these pliers have holes in them and there's a little pin, it's actually on the other side, but there's a pin right about here that sticks out. And I use that to open the bands. Uh, the bands come on a string of a hundred of them on a metal string and they're numerically, you know, sequentially numbered. And then I pull off one band out of the, the film canisters and open it with the pliers and then fit it into the pliers and then uh, carefully um, put it around the bird's leg and then close the pliers. And you notice I'm holding on to the bird's foot. So that's to, to eliminate or at least uh, minimize the chance that the bird's gonna struggle and move that leg at the last instant. So um, it takes just a, a, a second, you know, it's very, very quick. Now, the other thing is once we have the band on the bird, you've identified the bird, you know when and where you, you caught the bird. If the bird gets away, at least you have that information. But then we collect more, more information about the bird and the, the condition that it's in. Um, one thing that we look for is, especially looking at the, the, the migratory birds, um, what, what condition are they in? Are they about ready to migrate? Have they just arrived um, after a storm? Um, and the one way you do that is you look right here. See the color difference here? This actually right here is fat, stored fat. This is the, the flight muscle here. So muscle's red, fat's orange. Um, and there's a scale between zero and seven um, to determine how much fat. This would probably be a fat of four or five because what they have is a little hollow and you can actually feel this on the bottom of your neck, uh, right above your, um, your, I guess your breast, your breastbone, your collarbone. Um, that hollow is what birds have a hollow there and that's where they store their fat. And once that's filled up, they'll store it in the lower abdomen, again, centrally located and then underneath the wing wing pits, we call them. So, um, so this bird looks like it's about ready to migrate. It's got plenty of fat. Um, the other thing we do, this is the trickiest part that I'm still learning. Every day I learn, learn something new. Every bird, every species, oops, sorry. <clears throat> it's sort of like being a feather detective. You're looking at the shape, um, condition of these feathers here. See how rounded the primaries are? Um, trying to determine how old the bird is. So these, and, and you gotta know your feather tracks, your terminology, all that. So that's why I'm looking at the diagram. You have the primary coverts, which are these feathers here that are right over, over the primaries. And you've got greater coverts, median coverts. You've got the primaries, secondaries, and then tertials here. And uh, depending on the species and the time of year, they molt these feathers in different um, patterns or order. Um, and if, if they, in some of these birds, retain their, their juvenile feathers or year, feathers from the prior year, 
um, into the next year and, and they would be more worn. Um, younger feathers are gonna be more pointed, sorry. Um, so here's an example of one thing that you can look for. On a wood thrush, this was in the fall, um, trying to determine between a hatch year and an after hatch year. Okay, which of these birds was born that summer? We're catching them in the fall. You look at these covert feathers here. Look right here, you see, oops, sorry. See these um, buffy tips? That's, that's characteristic of a hatch year bird on the secondary coverts. Here, you don't see them at all. You're looking, what's called a, looking for what's called a molt limit, the, the, the exact place between the new and the old feathers. And, and we have a really large book. It's called the Pile Guide that, that has all the information in it that, that tells you what you need to know or helps you interpret that. Now, the other thing, other measurement we take is the, the wing cord the measure of the length of this portion of the wing um, when it's closed um, and using this wing ruler. So it's got to stop at one end and we're measuring in all in metric. The other thing that with blue jays, you can tell the age, this feather right here, the Alula feather, um, if it was an older bird, it would have black marks on it, kind of like these feathers have, but this one does not. So that's a younger bird. Um, the other thing you look at is the color of the roof of the mouth, um, cat birds, Blue jays and a few others. When they're younger birds, they have a kind of a fleshy, grayish, fleshy colored roof of their mouth. Older birds, it's black. So you pick up those trips, ticks, trips, ticks. You know what I mean. Tips and tricks. That's what I meant to say. Um, the last thing we do is we weigh the bird. This takes again just a couple seconds. We weigh them on the the digital scale here in tubes of different sizes. Here you can see the band that's on the bird's leg. So right after this is most, most visitors to the banding station, they, this is their favorite part because depending on how many birds we have, how many people we have, um, how long we have the bird, we, we allow visitors to release the birds. So um, after it's, and sometimes they'll hang out, as you can see here, they'll hang out on the hands. Um, sometimes for 30 seconds, 20 seconds, you know, sometimes a minute or so, depends on the bird. So this is a worm eating warbler. So some of the data that we gather, you can see there's, there's a whole bunch of information we're collecting. Age, sex, uh, breeding condition, amount of fat, wing, weight, date. We also keep track of the net, what net we is the most productive um, and that sort of thing. So um, my wife told me that I'm only allowed to show two, two graphs or two charts in my talks. So most people don't wanna see uh, graphs and tables and charts. And this one, I looks like I need to add another year's worth of data, but um, just give you an idea of how many birds we catch. Um, we're not out there every day. I, I would love to be out there every day, but I have a day job. So, um, so we do it once a week and this is uh, you know, six times in a season. So this gives us an idea, a snapshot during the migration, or the peak of the migration. Um, and one thing we learned, you know, when I moved to Dunedin in 2004, the birding community said, oh, oh, the hammock is only good in the fall. You don't see anything in the spring. I'm like, oh, really? Okay, well, we'll find out. Sure enough, look and see when we caught the most birds and we could look at the species too. Um, pretty much mostly, except for this one, in the spring, in the fall, um, or I'm sorry, in the spring, we caught the most birds. And that's, we've, we've found that to be true that there's a lot of birds moving, using the hammock, uh, hammock park in the spring. Uh, my theory, very anecdotal, is that most of the birders were down at Fort DeSoto in the spring, so they didn't spend much time in the hammock. So um, anyway, all right, so some of the highlights after doing this for nine or 10 years, um, just again, a snapshot, over 1,300 birds total banded. Um, we've got 62 species banded uh, over that time. Uh, some of them, as you'll see here, these are the highlights. We might have only caught one or two or a handful. Uh, I think the black burning warbler, we've only caught one of those. Um, like I said before, we do catch Swainson's warblers, Kentucky's, you know, a lot of birds. Um, you know, we're all volunteers, uh, even me, I'm a volunteer. I am a master bird bander, but doesn't mean I make a lot of money at it. It's all voluntary. And I've recruited an amazing crew of people. Um, somehow they found me and some, for some reason, they stick around. Um, and then we've had the support of the city of Dunedin. Um, they close off some trails for us. They, they help with some maintenance of, of some of the net, net lanes and net areas. So that's been very helpful. 
And then we've gotten some funding from the uh, funding and other support from the local Audubon societies, Clearwater, St. Pete, um, Audubon, and then private donors. So, um, you know, we don't have a lot of needs, but um, we do need nets periodically and other equipment, you know, so that all, all, it all adds up. So this, this one slide, if you remember nothing, this is probably to me the most exciting slide. Um, after doing this for 10 years here, I did it for, I don't know, five or six or eight years up in, in Milwaukee. Um, you don't get many returns. Um, sometimes you get what are called recaptures. You get birds that you've banded the year before, two or three years before, which is very valuable information. But you don't get these long distance recoveries very often. Um, the percent rate is well below 1% of all the birds banded that get recovered. Unfortunately, most of the birds that are recovered are usually uh, mortalities. And that, that was the case in, in these two birds. So um, we had a very, very productive banding day in the hammock on October 20th in 2019. I think we banded over 80 birds. And I think it was the year that we, we tried to do it in the fall um, in accordance or in conjunction with the, the festival, the birding festival. And I think that day we, we were scheduled to do it on a Saturday for a field trip. And the weather was too bad. So most of the field trips were canceled. But so it was bad weather. But the next day was pretty good. We were scheduled to go out to Caladesi, but it was too windy on the water. So we ended up just, well, we said, well, let's do it in the hammock. We caught 85 birds. It was an amazing day. Anyway, two of the birds we caught, one of them was a, a Swainson's thrush with this band number here and a gray cat bird with this band number. And look at where they went. They were banded on the exact same day in the fall, which means they kept going south, most likely. I mean, the cat bird could have spent the winter in Florida. But then, you know, the next spring, oops, sorry, they were heading back, you know, heading up to their breeding ground. So one of them was found in Massachusetts. I don't know, something's going on here. And the other was found in Minnesota. Both of them hit windows. So we'll talk about the importance of. Uh, protecting birds from uh, window collisions, but it's really uh, pretty amazing. So that tells us these birds are passing through the peninsula and more specifically the west coast of Florida. And then where do they go? So they're not all going up to the northeast. Some are going this way. Um, it's it's pretty, pretty exciting. So just if you're probably wondering, oh, what's the most commonly caught thing? You're looking at it, catbirds. <laughs> and uh, I need to update this. Well, for Caladesi last fall, we had a, a day where we caught 130, I think it was 134 birds or 135 birds. 88 of them or 89 of them were cat birds. So we catch a lot of cat birds. Um, number two is a resident bird, the cardinals. We catch a fair number of recaptures of them. Then we get some other migrants, the white-eyed vireo oven birds, which you may notice if you're really observant, this our logo for the Florida Avian Conservation, that's our mascot bird is the, is the oven bird common yellow throats. And th this makes sense because the, the nets are close to the ground. So you're, you're selecting for birds that are closer to the ground. So you get hooded warblers, indigo buntings if you're in the right habitat. Sometimes we catch pain in bunnings, um, wrens with thrushes and then another resident, well, Swainson's thrushes and blue jays. So of the 62 species, this is the lion's share of them right here, the top 10 list. All right, um, as you'll see, if you've been out to the hammock uh, to, to see the bird banding um, for the first, you know, for the eight or nine years we did it there every week, we were open to the public. It's a public park, dogs, runners, joggers, bikes, you know, you name it, people were coming by. Um, so we get a lot of visitors and we get a lot of families and children. And so we do a lot of public outreach education here. Um, Kay, I don't know if, how many of you know Kay Prophet, she's, President of Manatee Audubon, she's one of the volunteers um, working with the, the public here, showing them a bird. Um, and here um, people get to, to release the birds, hold the bird, then release the bird. Now, after that, that amount of time, you might be wondering, well, okay, well, if it's so successful at Hammock Park, why'd you leave? <laughs> well, I just gave you one of the big reasons, the, the amount of people. Um, that park's getting more and more and more busy. Um, and, you know, I was feeling like, well, for the amount of effort, we couldn't leave the poles out. So every week we had to put them up, take them down, put them up, 
take them down. That takes a lot of time and energy. And I didn't feel like we were catching as much as we could. So I thought, well, where else could we go? So uh, after investigating a number of different locations in, the, in this region, um, we settled on Caladesi Island State Park. So, and as I like to joke, my life wasn't complicated enough. So we needed to pick a, a location that requires a boat to get to. <laughs> so anyway, that's where more volunteers are, are necessary. So, um, so we moved out to Caladesi Island a little over two years ago. If you're familiar with the island, this is the marina and where the ferry drops you off. 99% of the visitors, maybe higher than 99%, walk right here and go to the beach. Most of them don't come down here. There is a nature trail down here, um, but we, we looked around, we birded around. There's, there's really good habitat out there. I have a couple pictures. This is where we settle on. There's an old Boy Scout camp there with a pavilion, some picnic tables, and um, there's a lot of uh, some oaks and pine flatwoods in this area. So that's where we decided to, to start banding. Questions were a little bit different being right on the coast on an island. So looking at how are these migrants using the Gulf Coast, how important are these islands to them? How long do they stick around? Um, how much weight do they gain or lose? You know, how, how does that um, help them? And then the terms fire escapes and refueling stations, again, how are they using them? How long are they sticking around? Is it emergency fire escape or, or are they stopping there and staying for a while and then, uh, then moving on? Um, and we've got some nice birds. These are some uh, summer tanagers. Um, if you want to learn more about fire escapes and, and some of that term, there's a great article in Living Bird Magazine um, on this very topic. And this is where I got this diagram. So, you know, a lot of these birds are coming from the Yucatan and they're flying across. And weather like we had today <laughs> with westerly winds, north northwesterly winds will oftentimes stop the birds. Um, but most of these birds migrate at night. So, um, some of these birds may still decide to continue their journey tonight, um, but it'll be very interesting tomorrow at school at Learning Aid to see uh, what we catch, how much we catch, how many species and all that. So this is my second and final graph. So I'm a visual learner, so I like to see things pictorially. So again, this is the top birds that we had. And through two years, we had over 500 birds, 44 species out of Caladesi. And there are a few species that we caught, we've caught out there that we didn't have never caught in the hammock, which stands to reason because the hammock is a hammock. And out on the island, it's pine flatwoods. And so we catch towhees and we've caught some pine warblers and some other things like that that we would never catch uh, in the hammock. And this is what a lot of the habit, habitat looks like. Um, this is, if you look closely you can see some of the volunteers here walking back and forth, checking the net, the net lanes. The park does an amazing job um, managing this habitat. Um, it's, it's beautiful pine flatwoods, um, well, well maintained. They do a lot of burning. So uh, here are just a little bit about some of the challenges. I alluded to the transportation, getting to and from the island, especially when the, when the winds kick up, um, makes it either impossible or, or just for a much wetter ride. And I'm usually on the windward side, I guess. So I seem to get the wettest. I'm not sure why that is. <laughs> Maybe our captain is trying to stick it to me. But anyway, so that's one challenge. Um, but, you know, having a boat, getting out there um, early, you're, we're riding out there in the dark um, so that we can get down to the study site and open the nets. Uh, land management practices. In one case, um, you know, the park, I mean, they, they had scheduled to do some prescribed burning. It just happened to be where half of our net lanes were set up or going to be set up. So we got to the island. Oh, half our study site was black. So needless to say, we didn't catch too many birds in those locations. So, um, so we moved our net lanes. And then, you know, the next year when it's growing back and it's really nice, we moved back into that area. So um, the weather, I mentioned uh, that poses some challenges. I should put insects on here. They're definitely a challenge after the noceums we had last Sunday. Um, they're awful. And then, of course, the pandemic. We lost most of one of uh, most of a season um, to the, you know, to COVID. So, um, so future of migratory bird research, banders um, and researchers are still banding birds, but they're, as you might imagine, with the the improvement of technology, they're starting to to utilize other techniques. And these are some things I would be interested in in pursuing in the near future. Um, so some things are things like geolocators. You might have uh, heard of those. If you look at this painted bunting here, 
This is a geolocator, solar powered. Um, what it does is it, it uh, records the latitude, longitude um, every day or twice a day, however you, know, you set it on the geolocator um, for the year, for the life of the, the device. But typically these are put on birds in the breeding grounds because these birds return. The disadvantage with a geolocator is you need to re recover it and then download the data. Um, the next generation of devices, these are called nano tags, and they have shrunk these down. I haven't seen them personally, but shrunk these down to, to less than a gram, uh, maybe half a gram. So it's possible now to put these kinds of devices, these nano tags on um, warblers, oven birds, things like that. And these work on RFID uh, technology. So when a bird flies within 12 miles of this tower or a tower like this, um, the tower records it. And each one of these devices has an individual um, specific frequency, um, almost like it, it's reading the metal band, you know, which has a number on it. This has a frequency and, and it, I think it can even uh, record, you know, direction they're going, height, you know, some of those kinds of things. But, but so you put that device on a bird, um, anytime it goes past a modus tower, that's what they're called, modus towers, they, um, they record it. And uh, you, nobody sees the bird, but it's it's you know, you've documented that it's there. And uh, they're they're amazing, amazing technology. They started it in uh, in northeast northeastern Canada to track shorebirds, and now these modus towers are popping up all along the coastlines and in different parts of the country. Um, friend of mine works is a bander down in uh, Naples. They put up a modus tower, and they had some um, nighthawks fly by that had been nano tags were put on them in Montana and no one knew the flight path of uh, the migration path of those birds. And this is one that they probably had no idea that they went through Florida and now we know. So um, it's pretty exciting technology and the, the towers themselves are not super expensive to put up. And, um, and then you can, you know, you can contribute, you can support other research projects all around the, the hemisphere really. So um, so modus towers are are definitely the latest and greatest. Well, I guess the latest and greatest is the cellular tracking technology, which is um, using cell phone towers, I believe. So I don't know a lot about that, but uh, that's the next great thing. Then uh, we'll talk in a minute about isotope feather studies. So uh, if you collect a feather from this bird, say on its wintering ground, or maybe in migration, and then they analyze the isotopes in the feather, they can tell not super precisely, but roughly where that bird spent the winter, because most of these birds, before they migrate, they molt in their new feathers. And so when they're eating, feeding on things there, they're, they're absorbing certain isotopes signature that's uh, specific to that location. So um, that's some pretty amazing stuff. Um, and it was that kind of study that, that got my attention. And I came across a project called the Bird Genoscape Project. So this is something we're starting to contribute to this spring um, anywhere I'm banning. Um, UCLA and Colorado State University um, have started this project. Um, actually 20 years ago, a, a scientist, a professor from U UCLA thought, oh, well, I should collect some feather samples and maybe someday we'll have the technology to analyze them and it will help, um, help with what we know about these birds. Well, they, uh, Sure enough, with the Human Genoscape Project, they developed all these tools for sequencing DNA. And now it's, it's sort of like Ancestry.com for birds. And so they're using the technology, collect a feather, two feathers from, from individual birds from different parts of their uh, migratory path, whether it's summer, winter range, you know, in migration. Um, and they're building maps, uh, Genoscape maps of for uh, 100 species is what they're targeting. And the, and the Kentucky warbler is one of the, the birds that they're, they're highlighting. And so we actually have started collecting feather samples. So I can't explain to you how it works, how they do it. It's, it's a lot of um, lab analysis and that sort of thing. But if you watch, go on YouTube and type in Bird Genus State Project, there's some great videos um, explaining the process, how it works and um, how it's gonna help us conserve these birds, so. So before I wrap up and we get into the quizzes, um, I always like to put in something about what people can do to help the birds. It's not enough to depress everyone by saying we're losing all of our birds. And those of us who've been birding for a long time, I've been birding for 
almost my entire life, so over 50 years, and uh, we've all seen the declines of the birds. But there are things that individuals can do to help. Um, things as simple as providing water for birds. You'll notice I don't say give them food because not all birds eat bird seed. Um, most of them do not, but they all need water, especially um, if you can do a dripper or a mister or something like that, moving water really draws the birds. Um, so that's really important. Uh, the other thing that I've done, we've done on our, our home landscape, we've replaced all the non-natives with native landscape. So if you go native, provide, you provide natural food for the birds um, as well as cover and that sort of thing. Plus you're helping all the pollinators and other insects that the birds then will eat too. Um, this is one that's probably the most controversial thing that I might say tonight. Keep your cat inside. <laughs> um, you may think that it doesn't kill birds, but it does. And uh, if you're interested and want to learn more, um, one of the scientists that was with the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center wrote a book called Cats Indoors. Um, it's a really interesting read, a lot of good science. And, uh, and there's lots of good reasons why to, for the safety of your cat to keep them in indoors. Um, if you want, there, there are other ones. I'm just highlighting these three. There's Cornell came out with something and I think maybe Audubon um, worked with them on it. Seven simple actions to help birds. Things like drinking shade grown coffee, um, putting window uh, decals on your windows so that uh, the birds can see uh, it breaks up the reflection, that sort of thing. That's a big one. Um, so uh, you can look that up, seven simple simple actions to help birds. Um, I'll tell I want I added this recently, this slide. So as a person who started birding when I was seven, um, and I work with elementary students, I work with children from five, ages five to 12 or so, kindergarten through fifth grade. Um, you know, I really, for several years, had wanted to start at Florida Young, a Young Birders Club. And uh, I know in other states, Ohio, Indiana, I'm originally from Indiana, they have a Young Birders Club and um, it's amazing what kinds of things the kids can do. Um, and it's for kids ages nine to 17. So um, these are some of the outings. We, we took them down to Fort DeSoto. Here, uh, two of the young birders are at the banding station in the hammock. And this has never happened. And in, in all the years we banded there, we caught one male painted bunny. And wouldn't you know, the day these kids come, we caught two male painted bunnies and they got to release one of them. So um, to say they were excited is, a, is an understatement. So uh, this is a, an outing to Brooker Creek, and this is over in Northdale, um, checking out the rookery that's in the middle of a neighborhood. So, um, so it's really fun, and we're able to, to uh, expose these kids to all sorts of things um, that they wouldn't ordinarily get to. And, and for me, it's about helping them find other kids who are as weird and wonderful as we are, right? <laughs> that like birds um, so that they can uh, feel supported in that effort. So we've got some really neat um, outings um, in in the near future. Um, Ann mentioned we went to Crossbar Ranch with uh, Zach and Dave and we got to see scrub jays and burrowing owls and they really, um, really enjoyed that. So um, so that's something, you know, Tampa Audubon has been integral. I'm doing that with with Tampa Audubon as a, as a I guess, a committee. And uh, so you all are supporting supporting this project. And, and to me, the exciting part is expanding it around the state. So the goal is to have chapters of the Florida Young Birders Club all around the state of Florida. And already we have a steering committee um, with mm -hmm. uh, two other people on the committee with me, one person with Orange County Audubon. They're starting a Young Birders Club. And then um, I think it's St. John's uh, Audubon up near St. Augustine. And so um, they each have small groups of kids and, and over time we hope to have chapters in different parts of the state, Miami, Naples, Gainesville, wherever. And uh, then once a year we'd have a conference. So you bring the kids together and once they get older or get into high school, um, they can be the presenters at the conference. And then we bring in some young professionals um, to, to expose them to possible careers and that sort of thing. So anyway, you can tell I'm excited about it. So it's, it's, it's really rewarding to give back. Um, I can't say it enough times, the volunteer support can't, can't do this project without the volunteers. Um, it takes, you know, it takes a bunch of people to help and I train them over the years and sometimes they stick around. These two, and this one has already moved on, but this one's about to take an internship with the Smithsonian 
studying long bill curlews up in Montana, a uh, summer internship. This one's looking to go to grad school. So we're all, I'm also helping to train some of the next generation of bird conservation folks. And this guy's important. Well, they're all important, but this one's Bert who drives the boat and maintains the boat. So uh, very important. Again, uh, sponsorship support by the Audubons, Clearwater, Tampa, St. Pete, and then the Caledesia Island uh, Ferry. What they do is we get over on the boat, which by the way, Ann Paul and, and Florida Audubon donated to us. And we fixed it up and I'll show you a picture of it, Ann. You probably won't recognize it, um, but uh, um, we get we come back to Honeymoon Island um, on the ferry and they don't charge us. So, um, and we do have individual sponsors. So if anybody feels so inclined to contribute to the project, by all means, you can do that. Uh, if you wanna follow what we're doing, I have a blog. Recently, it was it was called for several years called the Hammock Bird Banding um, dot WordPress. But I since we're banding in other places than the Hammock, we change and I created the organization. So it's now Florida Avian Conservation. And after every time we we're out on the uh, on the island, Caldezi or banding wherever, um, we'll post pictures and information about what what we did and what we saw, and and I'll keep you up to date. Um, as far as needs go. Um, the boat we have that, again, was donated um, to us from uh, Audubon, Florida, um, only takes three passengers. And when you have six to eight volunteers, it takes, we have to shuttle back and forth, or some of the people come on the park boat, but that doesn't come until eight. And we need everybody out there by six, 6.30. So that's that's been um, something on our radar is to try to upgrade to a boat. So if anybody has, uh, know somebody who has a boat in the, in the Dunedin area, or um, which, which somebody who doesn't mind getting up early on Sunday mornings, uh, maybe on their way out to go fishing, they could drop us off on the island. So um, that's one thing that uh, we could use. Um, having a cart on the island, um, Bert, uh, we did purchase a, a secondhand golf cart. Um, it's certainly not as deluxe as these things. But again, if somebody has, has one they're not using or would be willing to loan, let us use, we're only out there for six weeks in the spring and six weeks in the fall. And the, the state park transported our golf cart out there. So um, anyway, those are things we're looking at down the road. Um, getting a modus tower set up at Honeymoon Island State Park is something that I is on the short list for the next year or so. Um, if there's anybody in the audience or anybody knows somebody who's a, I'd say a computer science person, electrical engineer, somebody who you know who might be the best person to help us with this would be a ham radio operator. Um, somebody who can help us with the technology. I know how it works and I know how important it is, but I that's not in my in my skill set. So I'm always on the lookout for people who can help us with that. And there, there are other ways people can help. We've had volunteers sew bird bags for us. We've had um, we have volunteer or people who come to the banding on Saturday. You know, they'll they'll bring us baked goods. Um, if anybody's a good sewer or likes a challenge, the nets on occasion, we have to cut the birds out. And so they get holes in them and I cannot sew. So um, so we can always use help uh, mending the nets. So that's a plus. So Anne, I don't know if you recognize the boat. <laughs> there you go there, it's, we cleaned it up and it's, it's running really well. Um, again, uh, photography credits, people who've taken pictures used in the show um, some of the slides, the history of bird banding, uh, I got permission to use from this woman over on the East Coast. And then again, volunteers, 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 you know the drill. So, all right, I'm going to take a drink of water. You guys can get warmed up for the quiz. Let me see if we can see people. There we go. All right. So, like I said, we're going to start with the easy birds. And you can only win one prize. So if you win, you get one right, then you gotta let somebody else have a chance. And I sent Mary a, a bunch of stickers. So once that's why she needs, she'll need your address. She'll mail you a sticker. Um, let's see. All right. So this one, if you can read, you know this one, right? I don't know, maybe Mary, you can unmute yourself and tell me if we've got an answer before I move on. Okay, I don't have any, I don't see any answers coming up yet. All right, we've got one answer, Magnolia. All right, good. 
All right, so that's the first one. All right, here we go. This next one's pretty darn easy, but we'll see. So type your answers in the first one. So Lauren, you you won one already. So he said one one sticker per person. So Rui gets the next one. All right. So you might be wondering why we give them this chew toy. If you've ever been bitten by a cardinal, you'll know why. Because I'd rather they bite the Q-tip than my finger. We have one comment, one answer here. That was a Q-tip sparrow. There you go. <laughs> How about this one? Our All number right. one frequent customer. You got one? Yep. All right. Now they're getting a little more challenging. The thing to look at are these stripes on the top of its head and the eye line. Okay. Sandy Reed's got that one. We're meeting Warbler. All right. Good. Now this one is a twofer. You gotta get both of them right. I'll give you a hint. One of them is our mascot bird, which is down here. And the other one is a look-alike. That one's very challenging. Okay. So Ronald has the oven bird and Melanie has a water thrush. Did she say which kind? No. We'll give her half credit. Uh, uh, Lynette says, well, okay. Yes, she did. She has an water thrush. She she did, so <laughs> Northern. Right. Yeah, there's uh, one of these days I'll get a picture of the two water thrushes together, but it's highly unlikely because the Louisiana water thrushes move through very early um, and you don't usually catch them at the same time. Now, this is a holy grail bird for, oops, sorry. <laughs> That one, sorry, I don't know what's going on with this computer, but so this one nobody gets credit for because you saw the answer if you were paying attention. But this one, most people have never seen before. Um, it's a very secretive bird, but, but in the last week, it seems like if you look at the eBird lists, um, a lot of them have been seen in the last week. Um, and we caught one on Sunday. So um, this is an exciting bird, the Swainson's Warbler. We got one for this. Uh, Ronald, you already answered. So Jonathan gets that one. You get it right? Yep. <laughs> All right. This is a threefer. So we get a lot of thrushes in the hammock. So I'll give you that much. The question is, which one is which? Oh, this thing has a mind of its own. All right, so you already know the first one if you were paying attention. All right, so I have wood, great cheek, Swainson's. Is that correct? There you go. It's not very often you get to see them all right next to each other. Yeah, all right. It's awesome Jim, we have Jim zero. gets that one. This is the hardest bird in here. This is a trick bird. Because oftentimes I get asked, what's the rarest thing you've ever caught? And this we caught at Learning Gate in our canopy net. And I, I'd never seen one of these in Florida before. And to be honest, I, I took it out of the net and I wasn't exactly sure what it was. <laughs> so it took some pull out the books and actually called my friend, Jason Gerard, who was up at Ohio um, Black Swan Bird Observatory and they have banders up there who had banded these before. So they confirmed what I thought it was. Any yeah. guesses on this one? We've got one up as a Western Kingbird. Oh, you're close. I'll give you a hint. It was next to, in the net, it was like two feet from a summer tanager. Cassin's right Kingbird. Way down, no. Sandy. What, what's the way to Great Crested Flycatcher? Wait is the Western Tanager. Is that Western Tanager, Jim? Yes. All right. Yes. So, well, but Sandy, you already got one. So 
So this um, was a very, very exciting bird. So, and I had to send a lot of photos to the bird banding lab because that's who you send all the data to. And they didn't believe me. So you gotta send photos and as well as all the measurements and everything else, so. Um, Jim, did so, you see that? Did you see the Western tanager when you came to my yard? I did not. I think you're still making that up. <laughs> I'm kidding. And he's nope. been here five years. Five I years. I know, I know. Well, it's kind of like when we went to Steve's house to see the Rufus Hummingbird or whatever. And he said, oh, it was the first year in 10 that I haven't had one. But fortunately, we were there. And that was the day they saw the, he saw the calliope. So calliope. Yeah, well, ni nice yeah. trade. <laughs> that was. All right. So I guess we can take a couple questions now. The, the harder quiz is only like eight or nine pictures, which we can do at the very end, do those quickly. Um, okay. Uh, before I start with the questions, let me read off names here. You people that I read off need to put your mailing addresses either in the chat box here or email your mailing address to me mary.keith at tampaaudubon.org so that I can mail you your winning sticker. And I'm gonna start with the last question that came in here um, first, Jim. Uh, Tammy Lyons took a photo Monday of a hooded warbler with an orange band. Really? Where can, how can she find out where it was banded? Uh, well, the banding lab is really good about that. It's a website called, it's just reportband.gov, I think. And um, they'll send, you know, they'll send you, they'll take your photos, they'll figure out what bird it was. They'll let, they'll communicate with the, the bander to let them know, you know, this bird was found here by this person, this date and all that. And they also send, send you a certificate which is neat. I mean, my wife got one for some red knots that we took pictures of up in, um, I guess it was up in St. Augustine or wherever it was. And, um, you know, they reward you as best they can um, if they can identify the bird from the picture. Um, depending on the, I'm surprised there's only one color band. There's always a metal band on there, but you can, it's nearly impossible to get the, the number off of the band because it wraps around the bird's leg. But actually, it's possible. I mean, the, I had a woman re, just in the last few months had a cardinal coming to her backyard feeder, and she took photos after photos after photos and put together the photos and, and put together the band number. And then she reported that. So, um, so yeah, report to them. And then if they can identify it, they will. And then that's how the bander gets that, that information back. Um, I'd be curious to see the photo just out of curiosity. So if she can send it to me too, I'd be happy All right. to but send it on to them and they'll uh, they'll get you hooked up with the right person and and include your email because I know those two people that I, I put on that slide in Massachusetts and Minnesota, I was able to at least email with them and get the story of you know what happened to the birds. Um, because if you don't get that, I mean that's that's important information too. Um, and I sent them stickers. <laughs> That's the best I could do. So, um, and it was interesting. The guy in Massachusetts was a, a duck hunter. And uh, he knew he had seen metal bands on birds, but he'd never seen one that small. So at least he knew what to do. Uh, the woman in, in Minnesota, I think I forget, somebody must have told her how to uh, turn them in. So, um, okay. good question. Yeah, I, I know when I was living in Paraguay, 40 years ago, I sent in a band number from a turn that somebody found dead down there and they sent me back a certificate oh, 40 neat. years ago. Well, uh, so Tammy, if you don't have um, Jim's email, email me and I'll pass it on to you. Right there. On I the have slide. it, it's up on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> ah, perfect. I'm, I'm looking, reading the chat box here. So yeah. thank you. Okay. Thanks Jim. Sure. Um, a question, how do you get birds to stay on your hand? Roy is looking at the photos there. I think with that picture, you can see. Yeah, it's called the photographer's grip. There's several grip, two different grips, primary grips. This is called the photographer's grip. 
So the bird might flap its wings, but it's, you know, especially a small bird like this, it's not going anywhere. Um, and, you know, take a few pictures and then we let it go. Larger birds, they have what's called the ice cream cone grip. So, um, because if I held a blue jay or a thrasher or some bigger bird like this, they, their wings are strong enough, they could dislocate their leg, which we certainly don't want to do that. But, um, and then there's what's called the banders grip. You may have noticed how I was holding the bird it's it's when people see it for the first time they think i'm strangling the bird but you're just cradling its skull between your two first fingers and you're you're holding the wings against their their body so they can't struggle and they won't hurt their wing so and it provides access to pull out one wing to look at it and put the band on the bird's leg and um you know keeps the bird safe and secure so yeah that's how we do it okay Qu question came here about modus. Where is that small modus tag applied on the bird? It depends on the species. I think um, some it's on a on an, on the leg, but most of them they get um, they get glued to the back feathers. So then the bird would molt it off after a year. Um, some birds, since I've never applied them, I'm I'm guessing a little bit, but some um, they have these little backpacks. And they have um, little little threads or string, strong string to hold it on, so um, you're not adding a lot of weight. You're not impinging the bird's uh, flight. Um, but uh, they do have a weak point in there, so if the bird got it snagged on something, it would tear off and fall off and wouldn't kill the bird. And you might have heard the story recently about the researchers in Australia who put some uh, of these backpack devices transmitters on some magpies and the magpies quickly, you know, in like 20 minutes, the ones that didn't have it on were helping the other ones take them off. So <laughs> they learned something about the social behavior of magpies, but um, they lost some expensive uh, transmitters. But um, if you go on the MOTUS, just type in M-O-T-U-S, uh, wildlife tracking their videos, um, you can actually see where the, the um, towers are around Florida, around the world. You can even click on them and see what what data they've recorded, what birds have flown by. So it's it's pretty pretty uh, cool stuff. Okay. Um, next question: How are the water birds and ducks captured for banding? They, I believe, they have a, a trap, uh, metal uh, wire mesh traps, and most of them are caught during their eclipse plumage. Phase. There's a phase with a lot of the, these songbirds, they, they molt their feathers symmetrically, um, in, individual feather at a time. So you'll see a bird that's replacing like primary number seven, and you'll notice that on the other side, it's, it's molting in the, the same primary because they need to keep flying. Ducks will drop all their flight feathers at the same time, which there, so there's a time I think it's only a couple of weeks where they're flightless. So the biologists take advantage of that and just kind of corral them. And then they, they ban them all at that time. I've never seen it done or done it, but it'd be kind of interesting to see how they do it. How long do the RFID tags keep working? And do they need to be in a very narrow cone to interact with the antennas? Well, I believe that with the modus towers that you notice the different um, prongs, you know, um, and you can put multiple prongs facing different directions, mm -hmm. but I believe it's a 12, it's, it's a 12 mile either diameter or radius circle. So it depends on where you locate it and where you think most of your birds are going. So if we're putting it at Honeymoon Island, we're thinking most of the birds are traveling along the coast. So you would face your your points, your antenna out that, those directions. But if, if you spend a little more money, you can get all four directions covered. But you'll, you'll notice that in parts on the map for MODIS, that's why they, they need more MODIS towers because it's only 12 miles. Um, and one researcher in Gainesville with Smithsonian was pretty smart because you, know, you can only afford so many of these things. He actually created a fence, kind of like a fence and put a bunch of them around Gainesville across the state of Florida, thinking, okay, all the birds that are flying up, up the peninsula would uh, go past this. And I don't know how well or poorly that has worked for them, but um, 
So, and a lot of the wildlife refuges are putting these up. I don't know how many state parks um, are doing it, but uh, you know, like I said, I'd like to get Honeymoon Island to do one. And there's a colleague I have who bans Birds and Bill Bag State Park in Miami. She's been doing it for 20 years. I don't think they have a modus tower there, but I think the zoo nearby does. Um, and in our area, uh, Fort DeSoto has one. I don't know if it's still operational, um, but it's something that is worth pursuing. So as far as the, the RFID, I don't know. I'd ha you'd have to read up more on that. Um, usually the lifespan of those tags is maybe a year or so. Uh, it depends on the battery, you know, battery life. The larger devices like uh, what Gina Kent puts on Swallowtail Kites, those are satellites, transmitters, but they still, they go by cell phone towers and download the data along their journey. But those are usually they're solar powered, or I think in her case, they might last two or three years on average. But I know the one um, St. Pete Audubon funded, it's called Sawgrass. It's been going for at least four years, um, still collecting data and sharing data. So <laughs> that's pretty neat. Okay. Um... I'm going to skip up to the very first question that came in. Do you publish the results of your findings? And if so, where? Um, not yet. I still have to analyze it. And uh, the hope is to get it into journals, um, you know, uh, floor, uh, FOS journal. Um, I'm not a scientist, so I'm not um, well versed on statistics. So I'm um, seeking a partner. And I think, you know, whether it's a professor or someone like that to help with the analysis. So that's a good question. I mean, I, I write annual reports to the, to the, um, to the uh, fish and wildlife and the uh, bird banding lab. I mean, for your permits, you have to get them renewed every year or every other year. And I have three permits because I'm in a state park. So I need uh, to get a permit from DEP as well as FWC and the bird banding lab, which is uh, in Maryland, the US Geological Survey. Okay, um, here's a note to you. Hi, Mr. McGinnity. Thanks so much for doing your lecture. Very interesting and informative. You were my camp counselor over at Brooker Creek back 15 years ago. What a delight <laughs> to know you're still in the area doing such important work for the environment as well as still working in education for the next generation. Your work is so important and truly makes a lasting impression on young birders. And this is from Lauren. So, Lauren, well, you years of history. Me. That's great. That's really nice. It'll keep me going for at least another five years. <laughs> Good. Okay. And then there's a question here. So, so there is a back and forth on the. Uh, ethicalness of keeping cats either indoors or outdoors. Do you have any scientific research to back up someone else's claim that living indoors contributed significantly to cat welfare? I don't even see any peer reviewed studies to back your claim. All right, well, I'll refer you to that book. And if you want, I can go grab it. So the author is Peter Mara, M-A-R-R-A, -R -R -A, and he quotes a number of studies. And, and there's a whole chapter in the book. It's called Cats Indoors, I believe, or oh, I could be wrong, but um, but you'll find it pretty easily. And he has a whole chapter on um, health reasons, diseases that um, domestic cats get when they get outside. And um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of research that's been done. Yeah, I would like to point out that the Florida Ornithological Society has a position paper on this subject that does quote the the research that's been done the health effects for the the cats the birds and people effects of some of the diseases that are transmitted by by cats so so it's very important that cats be kept inside but you can go online to fosbirds.org and look for the position paper on that subject exactly the gentleman who made that comment, I think, left the conversation, you know, left the room after he made those comments. Okay. Okay. Um, Jim, here's another question that came in. What is the fatality rate of banded birds? While they're being banded or after they've been banded? 
I don't know. Nancy, if you're yeah, so, uh, my it's question is thank you for that. And you it's such wonderful work you do. And I'm not meaning to be um critical in any way, but do you have a fatality rate while you're banding the birds that you can speak to? Um, very, very few. Um, Great. And the banding lab asks um, banders to report that information as well. If there are any injuries or if there were um, mortalities. And personally, I banded over uh, probably 3000 birds, maybe more. And I've had very few. Um, most of them are predator related. So there may be a hawk that flies by and sees a bird caught in the net and then will, uh, but it's, it's very rare. It's very rare. So, and you know, if that happens, we close nets, we move nets, we check them more frequently. In one case, I actually stationed a volunteer next to a net to, to prevent that from happening again. So, um, so that's, yeah, we definitely do everything we can to, to minimize the stress on the birds and, uh, and keep that rate really, really low. Um, and you're right, it's, it's an ethical dilemma. We all love birds um, and we wouldn't wanna harm them, but the information that is learned and, and gathered to, to, it's looking at the bigger picture as far as conserv conserving these species and what we can learn can help the entire species. And, and there may be one or two um, fatalities as a result, but um, to give you an idea, to put it in perspective, the the mortality rate of migratory birds um, in their first year is about ninety percent. Mm -hmm. So we have a million birds that are hatched in a summer, and ninety percent of those will not make it to maturity. So again, not to not to diminish it, that say dismiss it, but um, it puts it in context and perspective that it's. It's a very, very small percentage. So, um, thank you for that. I appreciate, question, that. I appreciate the work you're doing. No, oh, thank you. Thank you for your time. Do you, anybody ready for a few more quiz, quiz birds, or just some pretty pictures before you go to bed? Yeah. All right. Since the hardcore birders are still on the line, right? All five of you. Hopefully, it's more than five. So pieces and parts. One advantage of, of banding these birds is you get to see them very, very close and to see the beauty and the, the detail and the feathers. And um, so any ideas on this one? This is a warbler. See, its wing cord is 54 millimeters. I'll just power through them. This is a Perula, Perula warbler. Okay, Melanie got that one. Oh, did she? All right, I'll go faster then. How about this one? You saw it earlier. It was the one that matched my wife's shirt color. I don't know if that helps you. If someone says indigo bunting, somebody else says blue jay. There you go. Indigo, okay. B Thomas, I need your address. This one I forgot to give the Q-tip to. <laughs> So we've only caught a handful of these. Blue grosbeak. The yeah, they're very pretty. All right. Well, Melanie, you've got a couple already. So let's see. And Sandy, so the same people got. Okay. No answers there. I'll take a stab at yellow throated. There you go. Jonathan's got prothonotary. Good, good. All right. This one we've only caught one of. Somebody guessed that one at, at the previous mystery bird. Did they? Uh, all right. Melanie's got Eastern Kingbird. Sherry's got that one. Since Melanie right, already good. has couple winners. Right. Those are too easy. 
warblers, this is oftentimes the only look you get at it. You only get to see the underside of it. And this one has very distinctive um, undertail covert feathers, these black centers in the, in the middle of the feathers. It's pretty neat. Any guesses on this one? Black and white. There you go. And this is the last one. We caught a few of these out on Caladesi last fall. Jim's got is, Tennessee. Are, yeah, these are white right here. Pardon? The undertail coverts are white. So I don't know if you could see that. Jim is guessing a uh, Tennessee warbler. There you go. Yep. All right. So. All right. You guys survived to the end. Now, I didn't mention, but if you're interested, I think I posted in a couple places on Facebook. We are doing our once in the fall, once in the spring, we do a public banding demonstration in Hammock Park, and it's this Saturday. So, um, if you're not already booked four ways from Sunday for different things to do, or you really want to see it, um, you can come out. It's it, it's a public park. I I've been working with the friends of the hammock to help you know manage the groups. Like last during COVID, we did do it, but we we structured it so that you know ten people came every thirty minutes, and we're going to try that. We'll see how well it works. Um, starting at nine, but those are all filled up. So since you're a special group of people, you made it to the end. It's a public park, you can come. Um, we're there, we're there at six setting up, but probably between eight, 738 and I'd say 10 is the best time to be there. So, and we're gonna put up signs from the parking lot by the butterfly garden in the uh, hammock, right at the end of San Mateo Road. Um, and there'll be signs that would lead you right to where where we're doing it. So um, invite you all to come. And if you can't make it this time, you know, just follow the 